Ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, let me thank you for your presence and uh, welcome to the conference. My name is Veronika Przewirała and I'm director of the International Law Center in Ordo Juris Institute in Poland. And I have the privilege to co-moderate today's discussion. Uh, we are meeting today to discuss one of the core values of the European Union and the rule of law, which has recently uh, become a bone of contention between EU bodies and certain member states, for example, Poland and Hungary. In a view of the prospect of the conclusion of the Conference of the Future of Europe, the issue of the rule of law becomes particularly relevant. I would like to welcome our distinguished speakers and audience, both in the hall and following us on the stream. I'm very pleased to see you all here today. Uh, in line with the schedule of the event at the beginning, I will ask our speakers to, short, to make a short introduction, a presentation of the current situation on the issue, and then we will move on to the Q&A session. Um, and now it's my pleasure to, to introduce our participants on our discussion. Mrs. Joanna Mudrewska, a lawyer and analyst in the Center for Legislative Studies in the Institute. Uh, Minister Witold Waszczykowski, um, member of the European Parliament from Poland. Mr. Erno Schaller lawyer and member of the European Parliament from Hungary. Mr. Horst <coughs> Buchale, lawyer and member of the European Parliament from Spain. Mr. Gannerbach, lawyer and academic, university lecturer in the UK and member of the European Parliament from Germany. Mr. Nicolas Best, lawyer and member of the European Parliament from Germany as well. Uh, Mr. Hank, and I have a big <laughs> problem <laughs> with your last name. So, <laughs> may I ask you for Hank Thomas Potter, or always Hank from Holland. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please accept my apologies for that. Uh, history with a specialization when it comes to the European integration. And Mr. Uh, Attila Kovac, Associate Professor and pro Project Leader uh, in the Center of Fundamental Rights from Hungary, whose main research uh, area is big data based analysis of the legislation and decision making of the European Union. I warmly welcome you, and I am very grateful that you accepted our invitation to take part in our today's discussion. Ortegris Institute has been working on analysis concerning rule of law from Polish per perspective for years, and uh, I would like to ask now Mrs. Janna Motrewska to briefly introduce our materials on the issue. Thank you, Renika. Uh, that's right. Uh, Order Europe Institute has produced numerous analyses and reports on the rule of law in the recent years. Today, I would like to introduce the mechanism of imposing sanction of members of the uh, European Union. First of all, uh, first of, uh, first of, of all, uh, I should uh, be reminded that so far uh, the accusations leveled against Poland by the European Union have not been reflected in the facts. One should point at the allegation concerning the procedure of um, selecting uh, candidates for members of the uh, National Council of the uh, Judiciary. In the context, uh, con uh, con context uh, of so called LGBT freedom, the European Union's uh, accusations are also uh, unfounded, as none uh, of the declaration made by Polish local governments uh, against uh, LGBT ideology uh, has uh, established a uh, zone free uh, any person or group of person. What is the legal uh, basis in penalizing member states? The preamble of the Treaty uh, of European Union indicates that the founding of the European Union uh, was uh, inspired by the 
culture, languages and common inheritance of Europe, from which have developed universal value, which are uh, inviolable and inalienable human rights, uh, as well as freedom, democracy, uh, equality and the rule of law. Uh, in Article 2, uh, the Treaty of European Union, uh, we find the clarification of the word value. However, we should consider whatever these values are uh, the same as those recognized by, by the fathers of Europe, Adenauer, Schumann, Schumann and uh, Monet. Uh, the value in question can be destroyed and become a weapon against member states. We call that on December 2020, 2017, a new phase, new phase of the procedure of monitoring the state of the rule of law in the member states began. Associated with the activation and mechanism of Article 7 of the theory. Uh, the mechanism presented in Article uh, 7, one is they have a preventive function. In order to initiate the procedure, it is necessary to ascertain the existence of clear risk of a serious breach of value. The first is on the hand, both. Clear risk and security are fully subject to expression. We assume that a serious violation is one that is uh, of considerable gravity or that must be characterized by high intensity and constitute a manifest violation of great gravity. It should be known that a violation of great or considerable gravity is uh, also a religious uh, expression. This situation may lead uh, to manipulation of plans and initiation of proceedings without legal basis. It follows from Article uh, 7 that the Council of the European Union may decide to suspend certain rights derived from the application of the treaties against a member state that has committed a serious and presented breach of uh, Article 32. The sanction imposed on member states are not specifically listed uh, in the treaties. They may include exclu uh, exclusion from the right of participate and speak in bodies, uh, disqualification from uh, from filling important public uh, offices with representatives uh, of the member states or budgetary payments to the member states. It should be pointed uh, out that in order to establish a serious and uh, persistent violation of uh, value by member states, Unanimity in the European Council is needed, which is not a simple task. Therefore, the European Union is taking a step forward. It's implementing a mechanism which is departs from the principle of uh, unanimity. On December 16, regulation introducing the conditionary mechanism was adopted. According to the European Commission, the purpose of the conditionary mechanism is to protect the union budget in the case of violation of the rule of law in the member states. But it's really like that. The Commission will initiate the procedure under the conditionary mechanism if it, was, if it has reasonable grounds to believe the following condition, uh, conditions are met. First of all, at least a rule of law has been violated in member, member states. The infringement uh, constraints situation or action to publish authorities. 
the infringement uh, affects or causes the severe risk uh, of affecting the ground financial management of the European uh, Union budget or protection the uh, protection of the European uh, financial interest covering both the revenue and uh, expenditure of the budget. The European Commission will act as condition uh, on a case by case basis. The mechanism will allow the European Commission to impose economic sanctions on countries that it believe do not meet the standards of the rule of law. The rule of law is di difficult to define and its meaning can be very broad. Moreover, the European Union will expand the definition of rule of law and bring under uh, its definition, for example, uh, abortion solution. In the resolution of the European Parliament on November 2017 on the rule of law in Poland, five additional uh, additional uh, units were devoted to issues related to the so-called sexual and reproductive health. Imposing sanctions can create conflicts between member states and break up the unity of the European Union. This has nothing to do uh, with the principle of solidarity. Are the actions uh, taken by the European Union a concert to democracy or attack on our sovereignty? For what is Europe? I hope that question will be answered today by our esteemed speakers. Thank you, Thank you very much for that. Anna, and now I would like to give uh, the floor to Mr. Wojtykowski for an uh, introduction from Paul's perspective. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for organizing the conference. Um, I'm very sorry to take a floor. I hope uh, I'll be very brief. i tell you why I'm taking the floor. I feel like a veteran of this battle because for many years I was a Polish uh, deputy in the Polish Parliament, so I had the chance to face this, uh, this battle when it started in 2015, and then as a Minister of Foreign Affairs in the, in the first government of Madame Mordata Szydło, I was the target of the assault of the international, I mean, European institutions against our government. I I know that you have a preference to discuss mostly the legal integrity of this problem, but from my point of view, this is a political problem. This is has nothing to do with the treaties, uh, with the legally binding documents of the European Union. Uh, in the first presentation, first in the introduction, we just really heard that the problem of the rule of law is only mentioned in Article 2 of the, of the treaty, but there is no legally binding document of the Article in terms, there is no treaty where rule of law is defined. Moreover, there is no document where is a definition of a judicial system. So there is no modern judicial system. In the, in the result, we have 27 models. In each other country, judicial system is different. I think that we made a mistake. It was a mistake of uh, government, which was treated in 2018 by the Juncker Commission and Timmermans there was a appeal from that commission, let's meet halfway. And government was treated by them, decided to <coughs> modify a little bit the reforms in Poland. And uh, as a result, there was no reciprocity from the commission. Commission, Juncker and Timalma decided, if you're able to modify, well, let's go back to the 2015 
and change all these uh, reforms you are to you started in the end of 2015. <coughs> I think we are not going to win this battle on the legal ground because accepting legal ground we, we are giving the prerogative to the tribunal to create the law. We are giving the Commission the right to interfere and define our not only disciplinary uh, institutions or, or chamber in our Supreme Court, but we are giving the right to define the whole judicial system in Poland, in Italy, Spain, Germany, and other countries. <clears throat> when you look at the contemporary discussion between Commission, for instance, and Turkey, and Balkan countries, and Ukraine, they do not discuss the Copenhagen criteria of membership. They mostly discuss the legal procedures of the legal uh, uh, system in these countries. They want to impose some liberal left ideas on this uh, on this country. So, concluding, this is a political and I would say even ideological battle between uh, liberal left majority, which dominates right, right now in many European Union countries, and conservative government. <clears throat> For the first two years of our government, we rejected this idea of legal battle, and we were trying to defend ourselves on the political ground. But as I said, then it was an idea to start searching for compromise between Polish government 2010 and the former commission. And that's the result, in this result of this so-called compromise, we are losing this, this battle. I hope that you can find a way how to escape from this trap, because this is a really a booby trap which was created for, uh, for us. I'm sorry, I'm dealing mostly with the hard security issues. I have a meeting with the NATO and American senators because I want to keep all the ties between European Union and NATO and the United States. These ties, you know, also they are very much in danger, especially recently, so I will not be able to participate in the whole discussion. But I wish you all the best. I once again thank you, all the Yuris, for praising this issue. We need more and more discussion like this and fruitful conclusions which we can implement in this political battle. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was both a pleasure and honor to have your contribution uh, in our discussion. And now I would like to give the floor to introduce us with a Spanish perspective. Thank you, Orda Yuris, for the invitation. My English is very bad. I'm going to read it. The interpretation made by the Commission bureaucrats and the parliamentary majority of this House on the rule of law constitutes an attack of the most elementary principles of the European legal tradition. The Spanish Constitution, following the fundamental law of bond, proclaims in its Article 1 that Spain is constituted as a social and democratic state, subject to the rule of law, which advocates freedom, justice, equality, and political pluralism as the superior values of its legal system. The rule of law, you know, as its origin in the French Revolution as a direct reaction against the absolutist model. The first and main source of public law is found in the community and is formally manifested through the law, approved with the particip participation of the entire national community. Therefore, the rule of law is a concept directly linked to the idea of national sovereignty and a national constitution. For this reason, 
It's not possible to talk about European rule of law since there is neither a sovereign European people nor it is possible to specify the European state that face laws passed by national parliaments. The Union is the result of an international treaty between sovereign states which attribute in certain matters certain competences to specific bodies in order to achieve common objectives. The EU is not and can not be anything else. Any of all these attempts to extend the powers of the Brussels bureaucracy are causing a crisis in the Union institutions as they constitute a fraud to the historic meaning of the Union. With regard to the Spanish law, there are not two ways about it. Even if some of my Spanish colleagues in this parliament from the European Popular Party, Socialist Party, Liberal Groups, moved by a federalist and globalist ideological prejudice, may make them believe otherwise. Our Constitution clearly states in its Article 93 that Spain, as a sovereign nation, only delegates the exercise of powers derived from the Constitution, not the competence, not the powers. In Spain, the rule of law has a clear meaning and is characterized by five elements. The rule of law is an expression of the popular will. It is the nation as a sovereign political subject that gives itself laws through democratically elected bodies. Second, the division of powers. Okay. In our constitution, this division is attenuated since the executive is appointed by the legislature and the governing body of the judges is also appointed by the legislature. Third, the submission of the state to the law. This is one of the fundamental characteristics of the modern rule of law that is included in our Article 9 and 106, saying citizens and public authorities are subject to the constitution and the rest of the legal, legal system. And the courts control the regulatory power and the legality of the administrative action, as well as its submission to the purposes that justify it. The question is, what control do we have over what the Commission does? The, the condition of a subjective public right, the citizen has a guarantee, a sphere of personal freedom that limits the political power, and the guarantee of fundamental rights. This guarantee is made to fall on the judges and the constitutional court, which, for example, in 2021 declared at least twice as a consequence of appeals filed by Vox that the socialist and communist coalition that covers Spain massively violated the rights of Spaniards through the unconstitutional declarations of the states of the earth. Consequently, the rule of law contained in Article 2 of the Union Treaty cannot be understood as intended by this majority in this parliament as the obligation to assume a specific ideology. Climate fanaticism, the gender theory that eliminates the biological identities of men and women, the doctrine of open borders, indiscriminate and free abortion, sexual indoctrination in schools are not part of the rule of law. All of these topics are only an opinion of the party. All of these topics are opposite to the right of life, to the family institution, to common sense, or to energy sovereignty. The rule of law can only be understood. One, the union is founded on respect for the rule of law of each of its members. That is, respect for the national constitutions and the laws used by the national parliaments. Second, the union understates respect national competences in everything that is not exclusive to the Union. In Spain, the norm is clear. Article 31 
of our international treaties are state that the rules of constitutional rank are superior to every other law, including international treaties. In such a way that, that our own law proclaims the principle of supremacy of the Constitution. And afterwards, it will be necessary to get the distribution of competences so that only in cases of exclusive competences of the Union, in case of conflict, the community nor would prevail, provided that it does not oppose the Constitution. It's our position in Spain, and thank you very much for the degrees. Thank you very much as well. And uh, now, uh, please let me give the floor to Mr. Charlotte Barras and uh, provide us with the perspective from that. Hi, Barry. Honorable guest. The organizers, first of all, I would like to thank you for your kind welcome. Uh, I can't express how happy I am that we can once again attend events with uh, personal attendance and we discuss such important topics like the question of the rule of law throughout Europe. It is of all utmost importance to speak about this issue because questions related to it are nowadays widely discussed in the European context and unfortunately the term gets more and more bitter after this. That is said the plausible side effect of the subordination to political interests of one of the core values that the European Union is based on. In order to speak coherently and firmly about the rule of law, I suggest to take a glance at the recent history of the European debate uh, concerning this topic. We see that the principle-based conception of the rule of law, which uh, was uh, still so clearly and well-founded in the treaties, seems to be slowly evaporating and being tried to be confined to various weak legal instruments by the EU institutions, according to their own tastes. As a first move, in support of the other otherwise unfounded EU institutional objections to the Hungarian fundamental law in 2014, the European Commission introduced the so-called rule of law framework. This was followed almost every two years by something new. The rule of law report, the rule of law cycle, the rule of law conditionality. All these so-called rule of law procedures are uh, characterized by conceptual confusion, intellectual insignificance, pressure and political bias, semi-scientific ideological aspiration, underestimation of democracy, and uh, majority decision-making. These instruments, however, still aim to prevent emerging threats to the rule of law. And in case of need, the Commission accordingly has to trigger the mechanisms to Article 7 of the Treaty on the European Union. This step, if we accept the legal supremacy and the basic truths of common sense, requires a clear, objectively interpretable and uniform and legally sound definition of the term on which the whole procedure can be based. After all, the fulfillment of these conditions requires nothing more than the rule of law itself. This is, however, not and has never been the case. The definition of rule of law is a living organism and it has many facets that are differing from country to country. Accordingly, we can speak of national specificities, which do not allow a general definition of the rule of law as the EU would like to achieve. As a result, ever since all debates concerning the specific situation of rule of law in the EU member states becomes the victim of ideological debate and political battles. The rule of law as a principle uh, means that the law is ruling over the people, the law is the master, which as opposed to the often biased, the individual people measures by equal, fair, impartial standards. If democracy and the rule of law, which constantly control the will of the majority, are in balance, they can guarantee the reconciliation of social will and the rights of citizens and minorities and those peace in society. If this balance is upset in either direction, it could easily jeopardize the modern democratic rule of law. Legislation that ignores the rights of the individual, certain communities, results in significant social dissatisfaction and conflict. And uh, the rule of law undermines the government's ability to act and undermines people's faith in the democratic institutions. We in Central and Eastern Europe are well acquainted with the examples of both cases. 
We can clearly see that the ongoing ideologically fueled uh, debate jeopardizes the sound legal definitions and the accountability. Because if we try to uh, coerce something that has no firm legal argumentation and a set definition, the only thing we will get is confusion. Uh, diverging positions and an overly politicized battle for the supremacy of interpretation. In the case of Hungary, the situation is a bit more thrown. As the opposition, which has suffered a crushing defeat at the recent parliamentary elections, has not been able to stand up for its domestic political aims in Hungary for years. It exports its ideological load of anger to European politics, where they get five minutes of fame in a mainstream left-wing political arena. In Hungary, uh, accordingly, we need to take our stand in favor of the common sense and to formulate our arguments before the already mentioned premises. However, from a Hungarian point of view, we cannot accept any kind of regulation from an EU body that is not based on the intergovernmental dialogue. That is clearly the case with the rule of law debate. The contradiction on the European level is caused by the fact that the rule of law should originally be acknowledged as the foundation of all legit legitimation procedures in the EU. We can see that the European Commission has recently started preparing annual reports on the rule of law in the member states. It is more than telling that no such reports are produced concerning the operations of the European institutions themselves. Due to the regrettable fact that the EU institutions are refusing, uh, refusing to acknowledge that Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union applies to them, and even to them in the first place. In addition to legal obligations, the building of Europe's common future and uh, those, the process of European integration must be based on trust. Unfortunately, however, there is an increasingly common tendency for the EU and its institutions uh, to view the internal, internal workings of the individual member states through a deceptive view of mistrust, thereby also expressing political opinions. They do this despite the fact that member states, including Hungary, have always been open to dialogue and scrutiny. The other problem is uh, the case of opinions, judgments, are sometimes made in advance with a hasty attitude. This was the case recently with the national elections, the conduct of which was condemned in advance by the European left. Yet, the report of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in the European States uh, that uh, in Europe states that the Hungarian elections were conducted in a clean and orderly manner, in accordance with the law. If such allegations are becoming more frequent, we must ask ourselves how we are responding to the real or imagined problems that the EU mentions in connections with Hungary and other countries. An additional Hungarian example for the increasingly neg negative uh, perceptions was set by last year's Libe mission which came to Hungary with a pre-formulated opinion and wanted to examine the situation of freedom of the press, the independence of the judiciary, the rights of minorities, and the general situation of rule of law. Despite the fact that there are few press cultures in Europe as diverse, varied, and manifold as the Hungarian one, and that the guarantees of the fundamental law ensures the full independence of the judiciary, these were simply ignored by the self-appointed inquisitors of the European left. Nor did they pay, they pay any attention to the fact that the Hungarian government has done so much in the last five years to help religious and ethnic minorities in Hungary to catch up and thrive, and to support, support each other in every family that I do not have the time to list all their measures in the introductory speech. That is why, as before, we do not feel that the current and previous attacks on the rule of law in Hungary are justified, and we are open to legitimate and reasonable dialogue on all issues because Hungary has had and we have nothing to hide. It is, however, disappointing to that uh, that this what uh, Poland or Hungary has to undergo can simply happen to a sovereign state in the United Europe, which has taken up the motto in Veritia Concordia, and that all in the midst of a world crisis, exacerbated by the Greek war and barely emerging from a pandemic situation, where ensuring the economic strength and resilience of the European Union would be of utmost importance. Instead of that, the European Union is threatening us with financial sanctions if we do not adapt to their values set by left-wing ideological schemes. If the EU is uh, serious about sustainable unity through its diversity, it should listen to the Hungarian responses and not try to divide the nations of Europe with political disputes. 
using the double standards it has been used to. What is needed is not an enforced desire for compromise, but a tolerance based on uh, consensus, which can promote peaceful coexistence and the development of nation states. Aggressive ununiformization, however, is not working. As the Hungarian voters have shown by grieving the national conservative government, has to give a stronger mandate than ever to continue its constructive and enriching work for the benefit of the country and the whole of Europe. In this way, a country with a thousand years of culture in the heart of Europe has set a direction for itself, which is not the past but the future for a whole continent. It is with this posture that we stand before the upcoming debates, in which we will always hold the treaties whose legal framework we have adopted and within which we have defined Hungarian policy for the benefit of all Europeans. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much for that. And uh, now I would like to ask for the contribution uh, Mr. Beck from Germany. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I suppose it's both a very German contribution, but it has left nothing, nothing. Oh, no. yeah, sorry. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I suppose it's in the sense of a German contribution, but I assure you it's got nothing um, in common with a modern or contemporary German view uh, on these matters. Now, I'd like to take a slightly more abstract uh, approach here. Of course, I'm a lawyer but I also read philosophy, so let me try to combine these two. Uh, it links in neatly, I think, with much that's already been said and with practically everything uh, of which I agree. Now, the rule of law is what the English philosopher W.B. Galley called an essentially contested concept. Essentially contested concepts are positively connoted ideas or abstract concepts, i.e. something that has a, uh, 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 that we regard as valuable or uh, positive in that sense. So these are positively connoted ideas or abstract concepts about whose positive core meaning there's widespread disagreement. So examples of essentially contested concepts are democracy, liberty, art, or equality, which are generally regarded as valuable or even great human achievements. This also applies to the rule of law. Now, at the same time, however, whilst essentially contested concepts have an identifiable or shared core meaning, there's considerable disagreement about the precise interpretation or application of these concepts. In that sense, they are contested. i give you two examples. So democracy is nowadays largely regarded as, uh, is almost universally regarded as something valuable, but there's very widespread disagreement about the precise form it assumes. Um, the prevalent version nowadays is representative democracy. Uh, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, would have been aghast at that. They would have thought it's patently inadequate. And in modern times, the Swiss uh, take a more direct view of democracy as well. And then there is the now rather unfashionable Vladimir Putin, who described himself as the last democrat in Europe. Now, I'm not agreeing with this view, but what I think he meant at the time was that most, uh, uh, most Russians approved of most of his policies. So, the outcomes of his policies or his objectives were in agreement with popular desire. I mean, I note, I'm not uh, embracing this view, I'm merely uh, using it as an example of an uh, goals or outcome directed view of policy. Now, others would believe that the out it doesn't really matter whether um, the results of certain policies correspond to popular desires. What is far more important are the procedures. Maybe that they have been endorsed either by referenda or 
uh, in elections. So once the party has been properly elected, it then uh, implements a certain uh, policy, and these policies are democratically legitimated because the party is not in question and provided certain safeguards have been respected. So all I'm saying is there's widespread disagreement uh, about um, the precise meaning of democracy. There are many conceptions of democracy, although there is agreement that democracy as such is a good thing. Now, we may say there are certain conceptions of democracy which we can reject outright, such as uh, uh, President Putin's, but then there are others, say, focusing on the degree of direct democracy we should have, or whether it should be purely represented, where there's legit legitimate agreement. Similarly, take the notion of liberty. Uh, famously, um, uh, the philosopher Isaiah Berlin distinguished between negative and positive liberty. Negative liberty, put very simply, is consists in the absence of restraint, and positive liberty also extends to uh, freedom from internal coercion. So, for example, a drug addict is not free to desist or to, to resist his habit. He's, to that extent, not free. So there are two uh, sensible definitions or conceptions of liberty, which capture each of which captures at least some essence of what we mean by freedom. Right? We may yet prefer one to the other, and Isaiah Berlin was quite clear in his preference for negative liberty. Now, back to the rule of law. The rule of law is rather similar in that regard. It has an identifiable core meaning which is widely shared. This core meaning refers to rules-based or law-based government. We've already heard about that. The idea of equality before the law and that no one should be above the law. So the rule of law consists in the sense of a defense wall of a citizen against unrestrained government. And of course it incorporates the notion of the separation of powers including the independence of the judiciary. We very much, uh, we have a very different conception from the EU about what constitutes an independent judiciary, namely if in Germany politicians appoint the judiciary that is independent, the judiciary, if in Poland or Hungary, politics uh, 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 has a certain degree of influence over the judiciary, then it's, it's a violation of the rule of law, right? Uh, this is essentially the EU conception of democracy, right? Now, um, but we all agree that independence of the judiciary is in principle a good thing, and it's tied up with the notion of the rule of law. Now, um, in addition, the rule of law is also associated with the protection of certain minimal rights citizens enjoy against the state and which they should be able to enforce through the courts. These rights fall into two broad categories, procedural rights in court proceedings, especially criminal proceedings, such as the presumption of innocence, um, uh, the right to be heard, and other rights for the defense. And then there are democratic or civil rights, such as freedom of uh, speech or the rights of assembly and of association. Without these, it'd be very difficult uh, to have a democracy. Now, rule of law is not necessarily a democracy, but it'd also be very difficult to have a functioning rule of law without freedom of speech implying the freedom to criticize uh, procedural inadequacies and um, uh, faults. So this, the core meaning of the rule of law, is widely shared. It goes back in the um, English-speaking world to thinkers such as John Locke and later to John Stuart Mill and the legal theorists Dicey and Badgett. And in Germany, it's most commonly identified with the works of Immanuel Kant. What's important about the definition of the rule of law I've outlined so far is that the rule of law implies no necessary connection with at least a uh, uh, far-developed notion of democracy or even with political liberalism except in its most original classical sense of liberalism. Now, um, of late, of course, this politically neutral or better, I should probably better say, constrained version of the rule of law 
or I've outlined, has been challenged. And it's been contested by a proliferation of politically unrestrained conceptions of the rule of law. The most unrestrained of these, you will not be surprised to hear, is that developed or uh, embraced by the European Commission. On the European web Commission's website, we find the following statement. Rule of law, the rule of law guarantees fundamental rights and values, and by, and by that, of course, yeah, I mean all the rights and values um, uh, guaranteed uh, in the EU treaties, including environmental protection, which they in turn intend to be the combat against climate change. And the rule of law also allows for the application of EU law. So we have an identification. You only have rule of law if uh, you provide for the widest possible scope for the application of EU law, right? So that's why I call it the um, politically unrestrained conception of the law, one furthest removed from the purely legal concept. It be, here, the rule of law becomes tantamount, synonymous, with the pursuit of a certain political ideology, which has already been pointed out. And that, in fact, is the kind of rule of law we hear about in the European uh, uh, Parliament in particular. Now, note a few features of this politically unrestrained conception of the rule of law. It's dynamic, i.e. not static, um, and not fixed, and of course that dynamism is then also endorsed by the Court of Justice. Why is it dynamic? Well, because obviously since the 1990s, the list of EU values and rights has expanded immeasurably. It's expanded in two ways, through treaty change and through the expansive, politically charged interpretation of the treaties by the European Court of Justice. So we have more rights now, and these rights are interpreted more broadly by the Court of Justice. So we basically are arriving, we are uh, uh, approaching a situation where anything that's in the EU treaties is part of the rule of law. So, when you violate, arguably violate, when you take issue with any aspect of the EU treaty, the thought police comes along and say, hey, 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 it's not on. This is against the rule of law. We withhold all your funds. Right? That's really what they like. So, any violation of the EU, uh, of, of the rule of law in the EU's eyes, immediately no money. Right? This is what we could call blackmail as well. And of course, there's the rule of, there's the, uh, and I've already hinted at it, there's the fateful uh, role of the rule of law uh, of the Court of Justice. The Court of Justice is not an impartial court, as both Hungary and uh, Poland had to learn. It's an imperial court. It views itself as, as, as furthering the ideals of European integration and as a motor of a um, uh, a particular kind of socially progressive, I would say, degenerative uh, political enterprise. So, let's wind up, because I've been going on for quite a while. We have two radically, notion, uh, radically uh, different notions of the rule of law now. One, the classical one, going back to when was Locke, uh, 17th century, right, so going black to the 17th century in its earliest uh, expressions, and more or less uh, remaining uh, stable, a stable concept until the 19th century, perhaps even the early part of the 20th century, and then, uh, which I call the politically restrained notion of the rule of law, which is largely neutral and agnostic as to particular uh, political models and solutions, and then there's a politically unrestrained version of the rule of law which identifies the rule of law with all good things in the world. Now, logically, philosophy, uh, uh, logically or philosophy, uh, philosophically, it's very difficult to say why the one is wrong. I think we all agree on which we think is wrong, and why the other is preferable because these are abstract concepts, and the meaning of abstract concepts 
is largely uh, 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 defined by us. But I think there are some very good reasons why we should prefer the politically uh, restrained version of the rule of law, uh, which incidentally is not peculiar to the uh, uh, sorry uh, 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 un uh, restrained version. Now, why? The unrestrained version imports all sorts of values into the concept of the rule of law. Right? You do not choose between the rule of law, possibly, and other values, or the rule of law does not leave you free to discuss all sorts of values. Everything becomes a rule of law issue. And therefore, it blurs the issue. When the rule of law becomes identified with equality, with the fight against climate change. It is simply no longer what it uh, has previously always been. And I think, in the words of the philosopher, uh, the, uh, uh, the Irish philosopher, Bishop Butler, everything is what it is. And for the sake of clarity, I think it's best if we retain a relatively minimal conception of the rule of law, which leaves um, scope for the political debate and leaves more space for the democratic process because ultimately if all values become rule of law values then they are ultimately all the subject of judicial proceedings. So we extinguish democracy if we define the rule of law too broadly because the whole point of a broad definition or the rule of law is to suggest a degree of objectivity and impartiality which many political choices do not have. And that's perhaps my key argument against it. It distinguish, extinguishes democracy because it tries to uh, end and forestall political debate by suggesting that concepts which are essentially political or moral in nature uh, should be treated as legal. And we've come to think of legal as something that has to be interpreted by specialists, namely judges, which, as we know from the European Court of Justice or the German Constitutional Court, are ultimately never uh, um, impartial because they themselves are the creatures of politics. So ultimately, the law of law, rule of law, as interpreted by the EU, is, is merely the continuation of politics by legal means. So, um, I've not always been clear, and that I'm not entirely satisfied with that, but I think I've, uh, I hope I've been sufficiently clear. Yeah. Thank you very much for this extremely interesting and uh, very broad perspective on the rule of law. And now I would like to ask uh, the second uh, member of the European Parliament from Germany, Mr. Fest, for his perspective on the issue. Yes, I take uh, probably a bit different approach because um, I want to talk about the rule of law that actually uh, exists or does not exist in Germany. So it's just it's more like uh, let's say um, a report on what is not going right in Germany. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation. I mean, uh, all yours. So we know conservative think tank. I think we have too little conservative think tanks because most think tanks are run by left people. And so we need more think tanks like Auto Eurist. We need less leftist perturbats to uh, Eurist. We need more legal order and less chaos of so-called values. The theme of today's conference is rule of law in the EU. And it is very fitting that I speak because I'm in the Lever Committee. Um, the rapporteur for the European Parliament's um, annual report on the rule of law. And in this report, I have um, dared to, uh, to the utmost joy of my leftist colleague um, to speak or to point out what is going wrong in Germany. All Europe, as we all know, it is a conservative and Catholic institute. So for the EU establishment, it is, it is evil plus evil. So it's the incarnation, and so probably is the peace government in your country. Um, and accordingly, whenever we come to 
conservative governments that do not share the rule of values, which is uh, which is shared by most left people within the EU. Um, the EU policymakers are constantly bringing up accusations against your country. In Brussels, on the other hand, uh, the grievances that exist in my country are kept quiet. So let me simply compare the alleged deficits of your country uh, to, um, concerning the rule of law with those in Germany. In Poland, to start with, election results are not reversed if the political elite does not like the outcome. In Germany, however, this is different. When the candidate of the Free Democrats was elected Prime Minister in Thuringia with the votes of my party, the former Chancellor Angela Merkel on a trip to South Africa simply declared this election result invalid, which subsequently led to the election of the candidate of the successor party of the former Communist Party, uh, SED, as Prime Minister. In other words, the party that was already up to mischief in GDR times. The party that shot their own countrymen. And um, uh, secondly, in Poland, in contrast to Germany, there's no electoral mess. During the last election, federal election and election in, in Berlin, which were uh, done on the same day in September, um, 1,600 ballot, ballot papers were issued, 5,000 ballot papers were not issued at all, 73 polling stations were temporarily closed down, and in other three polling stations the election was cancelled because of missing ballot papers. In some constituencies we had 150 more votes than voters, 150 percent more votes than voters, and um, uh, people could vote twice, and in some cases, we had actually miraculously dead people casting the ballot vote. So all of this is possible in the failed state of uh, Berlin, which is won by the Communists, the Social Democrats, and the Greens, of course. In Poland, there is virtually no violent antifa that intimidates opposition members or destroys their property or even threatens those who want to rent them, their premises for political uh, events. In Germany, things are different. In Berlin, the regional association of my party, which I was heading for quite a while, um, had to search for rooms to make a convention for over two years, you know, and without success, because the, the landlords who are willing to rent out property to AFD are so severely threatened by um, Antifa, that even the uh, higher court of Berlin ruled out that even if some um, landlord um, claims that he was threatened, that that is enough to give him the right to, uh, of cancellation. So for my party, it is virtually not possibly, uh, possible anymore to do contracts with private uh, owners. So. Um, and, uh, and what's more, in Poland there is no interior minister, no federal interior minister, who openly endorses to the violence uh, of Antifa. This is also different in Germany. Our new uh, prime uh, minister of the interior, Nancy Faeser, from the left wing of the Social Democrats, wrote in last September, wrote a guest article in, in a magazine called Antifa, of course. No? He declares right-wing extremism to be the greatest danger, and this despite the fact that the number of violent acts motivated by Islamism and left-wing extremism is much higher. It is significant that in 2016, the then Minister of Family Affairs, Pernia Schwesig, wanted to increase funding for the fight against the political right to 100 million euros, and at the same time, cut funding for the fight against left-wing extremists. She said to herself, left-wing extremism is an exaggerated problem. Half a year later, we had the um, G7 summit in Hamburg, where parts of Hamburg were burnt down by Antifa. But of course, you know, left-wing extremism is an exaggerated problem. Just one statistic on violence against representatives of political parties. In 2020, so two years ago, there were about 700 crimes against representatives of my party. This figure is going up. 
And just to mention, of course, my car as all the cars of the leading um, IFP members in Berlin has, has been burned down. In very few cases, these acts of violence against us are properly investigated. And so, the same with my, in my case, after uh, five weeks or so, I got uh, notified by the uh, prosecution office, yeah, well, you know, they, uh, they had no proof and they couldn't do anything, and that's it. So, um, of course, they could, you know, if they, if they wanted to do something, they had simply to increase the pressure on Antifa, and we all know where they, where they live, and it's as simple as that. If you want to do this, if not, you know, you might have other motives. Um, one is inclined to think that they are not the side who solved all these problems, these attacks by Antifa, since there are many direct links between the Antifa and the Social Democrats, the Greens, and the Left. For example, the SPD leader Saskia Eskin wrote on the occasion of her 58th birthday, 58 and of course, Antifa. In the meantime, the budget for the fight against the political right has been increased from 100 million euros to 1.1 billion euros. Just imagine if the Polish or Hungarian government were to allocate such funds to fight the opposition. The outcry would be enormous. In Poland, unlike in Germany, there is no domestic intelligence service that criminalizes patriots for no reason. Just imagine, in Germany, a so-called constitutional protection office is ob observing the opposition. Our party is being watched by intelligence services. 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 I don't think there's a single country in the European Union where such a crackdown is launched on one of the leading opposition parties. In Poland, posts are allocated according to democratic traditions. In Germany, things are different. In the Bundestag Presidium, for example, our party is once again not represented, though it has already been elected to the Bundestag for the second time. Incidentally, this is a bad habit that we all know, also know from the European Parliament. Neither a representative of the ECR group nor a representative of the ID group is represented in the Presidium of the European Parliament. Considering that over 35 million Europeans voted for ID or ECR, one, ECR parties of course, one can only say the other groups are trampling on the democratic will of over 35 million Europeans. In Poland, a member of parliament from the ruling party cannot just get an important position in the judiciary. It's different in Germany. In the last legislative period, the then vice, man, vice chairman of the CDU parliamentary group, Stefan Harbert, was appointed as a supreme constitutional judge. Imagine the outcry here in Brussels if the Peace Party were to appoint the deputy parliamentary group leader in the same as the Supreme Constitutional Judge. Uh, Stefan Harbert is today the president of the Constitutional Court in Germany. I mean, you can't make it up. You can't make it up. And just uh, three weeks ago, um, the, um, some uh, court prohibited um, former SDP, uh, Social Democrats um, to become vice president of the financial court uh, because she was missing all the qualification needed. You know, but nevertheless, she was uh, proposed by the German politician, by the ruling parties, Social Democrats and CDU and FDP, so liberals and uh, conservatives, um, to become uh, the vice president of our financial uh, Supreme Court. You can't make it up. You can't really make it up what is happening in Germany. Um, uh, and unlike in Germany, the president of Poland is elected by the people. So who has a disturbed relationship with the democracy here, the Germans or the Poles? So you see, there are many reasons why Germany and not Poland should be examined more closely with regard to rule of law. And this is also a general idea of my report in the legal committee of the EU Parliament. The reaction of my report to the political, of the political competitors, the left does not even want to deal with the arguments of my report. The other political groups are trying to distort the initial intention of the report to already over 460 amendments. So there won't be anything left.
um, the leftists do not want to accept reality. Leftists want to falsify the reality to suit themselves. None of the arguments in my report can be refuted. But these people don't care. These people are not concerned with the rule of law. These people are not concerned with preserving democracy. These people only use, use these slogans to impose their own leftist and totalitarian ideas on the people. The polls are an eyesore for them, and I hope that the polls will remain so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I have just one question. Um, you said that the budget for the fight against political right has been increased. What, uh, what budget is being referred to? What? What budget is being referred to? Oh, the, 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 the normal budget of uh, the Bundestag. Ah, okay. okay. So, so, I mean, but just, just, just imagine, you, you, they use taxpayers' money, yeah. you know, to fight a democratically elected party. This is unheard of. You know, you can't make it up. I mean, if this happened in Hungary, in Poland, or in Spain, people will say, hey, stop it. You know, we can't use taxpayers' money to fight the opposition. This is, you know, this is, I mean, this is, uh, you know, the, I mean, more uh, unfairness and undemocratic uh, procedure is not, you can't think of it. You know, but this is, you know, the normal way in Germany. I mean, it's, you know, it's so ridiculous. And I always say, you know, please focus on Germany. Do an Article 7 uh, procedure you know, um, and start uh, dealing with the real cargoes here. But of course, they don't want to listen to this. You know, because, I mean, the Article 7 procedures are basically only intended to, um, to be used against two kinds of uh, countries. First, the small ones, you know, and secondly, the conservative, uh, run by conservative governments. Otherwise, I mean, if you look at Bulgaria or Malta, or so they can do whatever they like, you know, because they have the white right government. You know, if they were small, you know, but had a conservative government, that would be different. If they are big, they can do whatever they want, and so Spain, France, Germany will never face uh, uh, an Article Seven procedure. Never ever. Thank you very, very much, and. Um, now I would like to ask Mr. Schottkrest. Is it enough? <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, good try. Um, thank you, Ms. Fotos from the Netherlands. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this invitation and for being back here in the Netherlands. Where I worked for seven years for uh, Bastian Belder. Maybe one of you remember him uh, in the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, currently working together with Petty Alvarez, also from the Netherlands. Maybe you know him. Nice and my uh, office was uh, just on the other side of the corridor, but then the 7th uh, floor higher, so I know the way a little bit. But um, um, to the theme, uh, as currently uh, active advocating for life, family, and freedom, also in the United Nations, here by the Human Rights Council, I also want to take a broader perspective into account um, uh, and also how the rule of law and the changing human rights relates to each other. So, so uh, the rule of law and changing human rights. Okay? Uh, the title of my lecture is uh, of a postmodern EU with aspirations of a global rule of law with redefined human rights, changing human rights. Now, Article 2 of the Treaty of European Union states that the Union is founded on values of respect for human dignity freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. And Article 7, as already has been mentioned, uh, allows for the possibility to penalize countries if they breach these values, what Hungary and Poland are accused of. Uh, the problem is that those fundamental human rights are subject to change and interpretation and that democracy and the rule of law of nations are in this danger caused by the EU. So what is the EU? It's hard to say. But the bottom line is that this so-called ever-closed union is at its core a supranational project, one that stands above nations in the hope of achieving an unprecedented level of peace, stability and prosperity. 
EU member states are merging or effectively surrendering significant elements of their national sovereignty. Member states are ceding significant aspects of their executive, legislative, and judicial powers to supranational EU institutions that are completely separate from member states and that function above the member states level. But the EU is about more than just Europe. The EU supranationalism amounts to global governance, the realization of EU supranationalism on a global scale to bring about world peace by overcoming the sovereignty of nation states. The EU believed, has always believed, that the division of the world into sovereign nations, that that is the root of war among states. And despite all its difficulties, the EU for them is a sparkling rising star because the EU is, after all, the only real world example of what a global governance system might look like. Well, what is global governance exactly? No one really knows. That is precisely why it is difficult to translate. My informal definition would be global governance is the attempt to establish a global rule of law, not by establishing global governance or a global state, but by building the broadest possible network of international institutions and organizations that administer an increasingly comprehensive body of international law that binds nation states, not only in their foreign policy, but also in key areas of their respective domestic policies. And the key is building a global rule of law, uh, though in a good postmodernist way, and no one knows exactly what the rule of law will look like in the end. Then something about the new human rights. This global rule of law is closely linked to the assertion of a postmodern concept of human rights, which in turn is close to global identity politics. This new conception of human rights illustrates in an unmistakable way that the answer to the question, what are human rights, is not self-evident. For what one considers human rights depends on how one answers the question of the nature of man. And it is precisely with regard to this question that a postmodernist worldview transformation has taken place in the West. A turning away from Judeo-Christian culture, firmly rooted in tradition and truth, to a secularized culture, characterized by relativism, love of novelty, and as a supreme commandment, the freedom of choice. And this has had a profound effect on the understanding of what human rights are. Founded in the notion of the absolute autonomy of the individual of freedom of choice taken to the extreme, the new human rights are transformative and radically liberating. They aim at a transformation of man through his liberation from the traditional constraints of his freedom of choice. Much like global governments aims at the transformation of the world order through liberation from the constraints of the nation state. Most important among the new human rights are abortion rights, LGBT rights, and children rights instead uh, of opposed to parental rights. And how uh, how are they uh, these new? Yeah, that is the question. How are these new human rights transformative, transformative, and radically liberating? These rights promote a transformation in the understanding of what people concerned are, to redefine them as autonomous individuals who, with the help of their fully independent individual freedom of choice, can change thus radically, can change and thus radically liberate themselves from the constraints of traditional and societal bonds. Women, for example, are liberated uh, from their children by be being given the choice to get rid of their unborn children, to put it as mildly as possible. Children are liberated from their parents by being granted the right of choice before they are even able to handle that freedom. And LGBT people 
are even liberated from bodily reality by being recognized as having the right to determine their own gender identity in denial of the empirical fact that human rights are either men or women. Finally, the global redefinition of human rights. The new human rights ideology is profoundly destructive. It deconstructs human nature much as global governments deconstruct the world order. But there is something else. Since the new human rights are conceived in a postmodern relativistic basis, a worldview that denies the existence of objective valid truth, these human rights can be completely redefined. Indeed, with the denial of objective truth, everything is called into question. Everything that has been handed down through the past, everything that is true, everything that is good is now in limbo. And that definitely includes the question of what human rights are. And this uncertainty hovering over us, this question of what human rights are, demands resolution. So it becomes inevitable that human rights themselves will be redefined. For once the idea of objective that the truth is abandoned in order to embrace a postmodern relativistic worldview, human rights can be redefined by those who hold power. And this power can only be obtained and maintained through coercion uh, and just as badly there is no objective basis to limit political power once it is obtained. And with the global reach of communications, transportation, trade and ideas, the global rule of law is expanding geographically. Just as the power of politics to determine human rights is unlimited, so it becomes impossible to limit the power of governments to a particular geographic area or people. Global governance then emerges not as a benign concern to improve the lot of humanity worldwide, but as an unlimited usurpation of power that claims for itself, under the sign of universal human rights, to redefine truth and justice. And lo and behold, these newly determined human rights are the rights of the very groupings that identity politics emphasizes such as women and girls who get the right to abortion, children whose right to enjoy adult rights earlier is guaranteed by the state, even against dissenting parents, LGBT ideologues, and immigrants or refugees of non-European descent. Instead of guaranteeing a classic civil rights for all, the state, in the imagination of globalist human rights activists, would become an arbiter implicitly enforcing the rights claimed by certain groups against us. Women against unborn children, children against parents. See, for example, the parent protest against the incorporation of sexual diversity into school curriculum worldwide. Adherence of gender identity ideology against adherence of traditional Christian view of humanity. And Muslim immigrants against those concerned about maintaining Western values. And the mere fact that many consider it frowned upon me to defend the perspective of unborn children, traditional-minded parents, adherents of the Christian conception of man, proves there are already many, perfect, many perfectly legitimate opinions that are simply not allowed to be held. See, for example, the court case against the Finnish politician, Paivi Rasanen. I was at the court case in Helsinki uh, last month. Freedom of expression is in danger because of the redefinition of human rights, and therefore also freedom of speech and religion. And then the final paragraph. So, postmodernism turns out not to bring social justice and equality, rule of law, democracy and human rights, which originally sovereign nations enjoyed and, and can be read from Article 2 of the EU. What it brings is an uncontrollable totalitarian system in which those who think they know better decide from above for all people what their new rights are.
and how to enforce them. One almost feels sorry for these global contours. There are, but uh, practically, they are practically forced out of their goodness to seize more and more power over more and more extensive areas in order to secure all good things, not only for certain peoples, but to make them effective for all peoples as a global rule of law. So my answer to the question of if the rule of law in the EU is a concern for democracy or an assault on sovereignty is, yes, both. And it needs to be changed and it needs to stop. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much. Um, and uh, now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Atterakawasan. Awesome. Hi, Barry. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. Um, the Center for Fundamental Rights, where I'm, I'm working in Hungary, has an excellent relationship with Orbe Euros, and uh, maybe today's event is the next milestone in, in, in building something uh, for the future. Um, it's not a comfortable situation to be in the last in the row, because all the great ideas and all the great suggestions and all the great analysis have already been uh, put on the table. Um, but let me at some points um, to, to channel into the discussion. Um, the first, uh, what I would like to start is, is a little bit about the context. And I fully agree with the, with the linkages of rule of law to democracy and direct democracy. And this whole rule of law concept, as the Isabek said, um, jeopardizes um, direct democracy and, and what we see here in Europe. I mean, democratic empowerment in Europe has been initiated or supported historically, back in history, by the left. Uh, to give political rights to the workers, to give political rights to women, etc., etc., etc. But now I see that they are threatened by giving the decisions democratically to the people, to the voters, and now they are finding means, tools, in order to, so to say, curb or limit or to correct the democratic decisions of, uh, of people here in Europe. And I see uh, this, this whole rule of law issue and rule of law mechanism as a tool in the hands, so to say, of the European elite, left-wing elite, um, to make the necessary connections in the, in the democratic tendencies um, in Europe. What they consider, if, if there's a political stance let's call it conservative political position, which is against this so to say, enlightened Brussels bubble, uh, or which is against the federal Europe, um, then immediately the rule of law uh, tool can come and can punish those political uh, players, parties, member states, which are, are not in line with the Brussels expectations. Um, they invented this rule of law mechanism because of this. They gradually uh, add more and more content to this rule of law, like Daniel report what, uh, what Ernie mentioned, for example, in, in his speech. Although Article 7 has been and is in the treaties, so there is officially a tool for, so to say, initiating procedures against the member states which are violating the, the rule of law issues. The, the second point that I would like to touch upon is that uh, behind this rule of law discussion, the, the main fundamental question, and, and this is the fundamental question for years, so this has been uh, the fundamental question for years in the European Union, is whether this, uh, this federal state, federalism, or, or national sovereignty. And, and the rule of law uh, can be also interpreted or should be viewed within this, uh, this context. Um, there has been many media appearances of mine when, when people asked me or I was interviewed, okay, how can we apply rule of law for 27 different member states? Um, some mentioned here that there should be, I don't know, an exhaustive, uh, exhaustive list of, of criteria for rule of law issues. There cannot be, uh, in my view. Because 27 member states, historically, politically, uh, culturally so different 
And of course, this history and culture has an impact on all the setup, the political setup, the judiciary, the, the parliament, etc., etc. It cannot be measured with a one size fits all scoring table, call it whatever, which, uh, which the European Union, or better to say the European Commission, uh, wants to imply. So, diversity is not respected, although should be respected in, uh, uh, in Europe. And from this different cultural and historical perspective, how can you judge, for example, checks and balances in one member state? One member state. You cannot judge. How can you judge, for example, the media structure or media pluralism? What is media pluralism in, in one country? It could be something like uh, biased media in another country. My favorite example uh, for this is that Russian oligarchs still own most of the uh, media outlets in the UK which played a key role in uh, proposing the Brexit and pushing the Brexit agenda forward back to, I don't know, 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Um, who talked about the unfavorable media structure in the United Kingdom? No one. Um, but if there's another member state where, where the Brussels elite thinks that there's a problem, immediately you can be you can be the target, be it Poland or, for example, Hungary. Um, some points about the, the Hungarian position, because Hungary is now the only member state um, against which the European Commission is intended to launch the, the rule of law procedure, as Ursula von der Leyen announced in the European Parliament less than 48 hours after the outcome of the elections on the 3rd of April, with the landslide majority and four consecutive two-third majority wins of the, of the ruling parties in Hungary. Um, I completely agree with the statement that the, the rule of law mechanism is not a legal mechanism. It's a political debate and it's a political mechanism. I mean, the, the first gentleman from Poland told it very explicitly and I completely agree with that. It cannot be and it shouldn't be fault on a legal basis. Why? Because the final word will be in the Court of Justice of the European Union. And the Court of Justice of the European Union will always support, and history shows it. Look at the decisions of the Court of Justice of the European Union when there's a discussion whether European institutions or member states 99.9% .9 of the cases, the Court of Justice decides for a federalist approach for the European institutions, for the European Commission. So in the very end, if it's, if it's a legal situation and we consider it as a legal battle or fight, uh, then the final word will be in the Court of Justice of the European Union, which means that member states, sovereign member states, will lose, as it happened on the 16th of February, um, when the Court of Justice of the European Union said that the rule of the mechanism is in line with the, with the treaties and can be applied um, against member states. So in Hungary, we have the feeling that uh, the European Commission would like to punish Hungary, Hungarian people, Hungarian voters, only because they voted for the party which is not favored uh, by the Brussels elite. Mm -hmm. And let me say, let me cite another example, which is more like ideological issues. You mentioned LGBT rights in Hungary. We also have a refer had, had a referendum on the 3rd of April uh, regarding the, the child protection law. Um, even more voters voted for this. I mean, wanted to know because the question was posed like that. Which means that Hundreds of thousands of Hungarian opposition voters agreed with the position of the Hungarian government that this tendency uh, should be stopped uh, in Hungary regarding this, this gender issues. Double standard, many of you have already uh, mentioned that, and I completely agree. Um, if there is corruption in Bulgaria, no one cares. Uh, even Manfred Weber went to Bulgaria, now there's an upheaval in, in domestic politics in Bulgaria to protect the, the mafioso ex-prime minister of Bulgaria, Lafobo. Uh, in Slovakia and Malta, two countries which I very much personally like, they are shooting journalists, uh, but there is no harsh criticism on the, on the media situation. In Hungary, if, if uh, um, 
the radio station is closing down, which is close to the opposition, then immediately there are hearings and all these, all these things in Brussels, which seems to be uh, unproportional and overreaction. On this end shows the clear double standard that the European uh, institutions, including the Parliament and the Commission, um, applies. And the last thing regarding Hungary, as, I mean, the timing of this, of this step. I understand that the European Commission doesn't, didn't want to initiate the rule of law procedure before the elections, because the Commission wanted to avoid that it interferes in the election campaign with, by launching the, the procedure. But it was clear, and it's clear that it, it was already on the table, and immediately after the election they, they pushed the button. Although they say they are launching it, but formally, officially, Hungary, the Hungarian government, hasn't been notified about the start of the official start of the procedure. So it seems that more like political communication and practical steps are two layers of this of this debate. And political communication is very harsh, but on the ground, the, the exact steps from the Commission are, are not done. Um, and regarding timing, in this very complicated geopolitical setup that we are in the middle of, of. Um, I think it's a political failure from the Commission to, to launch things that are dividing member states. Not the European Union and, and European Union member states should show unity in, in light of this um, Russian aggression against Ukraine and all these economic challenges that we, will, that we are facing and we will face in the coming years. So I think it's a, it's a huge political mistake. Um, some concluding remarks. Um, Yes, the question of this of this uh, conference is uh, whether it's an assault on sovereignty. I, I, I think it is. It's an attack on, on, on national sovereignty. Um, and I think it's very anti-democratic that somewhere like, like experts or, or judicial um, high-skilled people are sitting in the Luxembourg or, or office or in Köln, maybe in Germany there is the Supreme Court, and they are deciding whether the voters decided the right way or not, and if necessary, they will correct it. This leads back to the question of the supremacy and privacy of e-law to national constitutions, which is, a, which is a widely discussed issue, not only in the context of Germany, uh, Brussels, or Luxembourg, or Poland, the Polish constitution, and the European Court of Justice, the Hungarian constitution, and the European Court of Justice, this, is, uh, this leads also to this, uh, to this question. And finally, what I would like to tell you is that, uh, and please remember my word in some years, what today is the rule of law will be tomorrow the democracy action plan of the European Commission, which was launched in December 2020. Now, the European Commission is like a jury and they are scoring the member states whether you are fine with the rule of law, you are not fine with the rule of law. In one, two, three years, it will be the European democracy package when Brussels officials will say, you don't seem like a properly functioning democracy. You seem, like, you seem to be like a liberal democracy. You seem to be like an illiberal democracy. And so this type of... Uh, of uh, superior judgment from Brussels will not only cover this rule of issue, but the whole democratic uh, and democracy issue throughout the European Union and in member states. So I'm afraid that the rule of law is only the beginning of this fight, and we are moving more and more and deeper and deeper into this democratic establishment and what is democracy in member states and what is democracy in Europe um, issue. We need to speak and we need to return to the treaties. This is my, my point. Please keep an eye on the outcomes of the Conference of Europe. Uh, the public debate will finish in April now, in May. Um, if you take a look at the uh, most frequent topics, rule of law is in the top. Of course, most of the participants, of course, are expecting more powers to the European institutions, more strength to the rule of law procedure, punishment to the, to the non-complying member states, 
And this conference on the, on the future of Europe will form a basis for further actions of the European Commission on this, on this uh, road. Um, for me, it's very difficult to talk briefly, although I, I, I wanted to do so. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm, I'm open, open for the discussion, and, and if there's, there are any more questions, thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. Uh, unfortunately, we have only 10 minutes left, but nevertheless, <laughs> we have a few questions we would like to ask you. So maybe I'll ask Jana to, to, to refer the first question. First question, I have to. Uh, first question uh, for the shorter, yeah. I, I have promised five. <laughs> uh, in the public uh, debate, there are many signals concerning uh, the costly attitude of the Dutch government towards uh, Poland in the field of the rule of law. It's really how Polish Dutch relations are the why does the Dutch government have such a strong uh, need to punish Poland uh, for um, the uh, violations? Yeah, thank you very much for the for the question. And, uh, I feel uh, for myself uh, both ashamed and outraged about the reaction of our government towards mainly Poland and Hungary. Uh, and you mentioned uh, uh, Poland, but I remember vividly, I was just showing a picture to, uh, to my friend here, and my friend again, and, and, uh, and his friend from Hungary. Uh, when last summer, in June, uh, the European leaders here were at their summit, and the Hungarians just had uh, adopted the child protection law uh, for uh, and, uh, not to have uh, uh, gay propaganda and LGBT and transgender propaganda for the children until 18 years. Very wise, wise uh, uh, law, I think. Yeah, I'm so started as a teacher. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I think it is uh, very wise. But uh, anyway, the reaction of, of Prime Minister Rutte was uh, the fiercest of all the European leaders. And he just said, either the Hungarians have to kneel for the rainbow flag or to get out of the Union. And that, that was, uh, uh, he said it, but the fact is that the European leaders and the European treaties don't have any authority in the, in, in the field of education and in the, in the field of health. which we totally unauthorized to make these kind of bold statements. So he should make his excuses. And I don't know why he became like this, because he started as a more conservative liberal. He's running for more than 10 years, our prime minister. I know him personally. He, 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 he's a very, very friendly man and, uh, and uh, very enthusiastic. But he, the, for the last maybe four years, he went on a far more pro-European way, maybe influenced by the by the much uh, uh, pro-European party, D66. Uh, the, they are very much pro-EU. Uh, so I think, um, uh, yeah, because of these two pro-European liberal parties, they are um, extremely uh, harsh towards uh, Poland and Hungary. Uh, but I am very happy that you stand strong in Europe. We really look up to you from the Netherlands and from all, uh, from all of Europe to you to have your back strong against this, this uh, usurpation of power from, from, from Brussels. Thank you very much. Uh, you bring a new perspective of this uh, issue. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, time only for one question. So I will ask uh, Mr. Attila and <laughs> Mr. Beck the same questions. Okay. My question is, uh, what are your recommendations? I mean, what should now Polish or Hungarian government do in such a situation where the conflict with Brussels? Well, that's very tricky, of course. 
the whole process is designed to exert pressure. Uh, the hope was that by threatening or, well, by effectively uh, suspending uh, the payment to the EU funds uh, and to Hungary, that would have, from the EU's perspective, a favorable uh, effect on the outcome of the Hungarian elections. Yes, yeah. um, it was counterproductive. Correct. Um, as it turns out, it was counterproductive. So, but it highlights, I think, the risks. Governments should be intimidated. Uh, so it's important to resist intimidation, because if you give way, then that will create a precedent, uh, and it will only embolden the Commission further. Take the argument over Ukraine. The idea is, if the European Union uh, does nothing to support Ukraine, that will embolden Putin further. Well, I'd say, if Poland and Hungary give way over issues where they're entirely, and I'm not saying the, uh, it's, I'm, I'm, the only draw, uh, 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 analogy I'm, I'm drawing is concerns intimidation. So um, if Hungary and Poland give way and make concessions, uh, granting the EU a right to meddle in the countries, these countries' internal judicial affairs, democratic processes, then um, it would set a very dangerous precedent to embolden the Commission further, uh, and if the European Union is allowed to influence the internal processes of, in a, of a country, then as soon as they can, they will send in dozens and dozens of Western NGOs, which will propagate these ideas, will just be a dam breaker. I think that is my great fear. Now, it requires great nerve to resist these intimidations. But why do I think um, conservative societies and governments should resist? Because at present, the uh, treaty framework within the EU is actually still quite favorable. Uh, there are many issues where unanimity uh, suffices. So, it would be very foolish. That's, uh, 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 in other words, as yet, the EU Commission cannot quite do what it wants. So you've just got to keep their nerve. And my Hungarian colleague has already mentioned the importance of the Conference on the Future of Europe. I'm one of the delegates on that conference. There are 108 uh, uh, members of the European Parliament. This conference is a farce, and that will be my last point. It suggests it's a democratic exercise because there are 800 conference citizens which have been selected by, the, um, uh, 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 by a company owned by an American private equity company, Bain Private Capital. These citizens, who know very little, came to Strasbourg. They were immediately boosted by experts, so-called Spinelli experts, who tell them exactly what they need to say. They've now <laughs> come up with 170 uh, recommendations. That These recommendations, pretty much to the dot on the I, endorse ideas that the Commission has been floating for the last few years. Take the idea, take migration. Um, they want to make climate change into a, a, a ground for asylum. They want to make the right to abortion into a ground of uh, uh, asylum. They uh, wish to uh, expedite asylum uh, uh, procedures. They wish to uh, redistribute asylum uh, or migrants throughout the whole European Union. They wish to abolish the idea of leaving your migrant into places with the term regular migrant. These are all ideas that, this is, uh, that we find already uh, in Mrs. von der Leyen's Migration Pact. So, but institutionally speaking, the Conference on the Future of Europe will be recommending the abolition of the, uh, of the national veto. So if this goes through, then it's all over. 
and I think it can just uh, zero over recalcitrant member states. That's why it's important to resist over threats to withhold money, but it's even more important to resist when it comes to the Conference on the Future of Europe. The Conference on the Future of Europe uh, makes recommendations that ultimately require unanimity in the Council. So, even one Eastern European country that keeps its nerves will be able to veto it. It's always difficult to act if you are alone, but if you do what you've done very successfully for the last how long ago is it, 10 to 15 years, the Visegrad Alliance, then you uh, get comfort from company. If there are at least three or four governments that resist, you don't feel quite so horrid about it, and you'll definitely succeed. The EU cannot yet do what it wants to do. Right? Sorry, that was a long answer, but I think there are a number of important points I had to make. Uh, uh, Two very brief points to add. Um, Let's see what the aftermath or what the consequences of future or the conference of the future of Europe will be. I mean, will there be like any will for for a treaty change or not? Uh, maybe they want it. Maybe they don't want it. I mean, I hear voices from Denmark, French, that they don't necessarily want it. It was just for showing up something. But no matter what, it will be a basis for for reference. As people of Europe wanted more migration, more power to the European institutions, etc., etc., et But this is one thing. The second thing, let's see how the political landscape of Europe will change in the coming two years. In two years, we will have elections again for the European Parliament. In two and a half years, we will have a new commission again. Uh, let's see the outcome of the French elections. Let's see the outcome of the Italian elections due next year. Polish elections are coming next year as well. Come to, Mistaken, etc., etc., etc. There could be changes in either way, and of course, and this is my last point, and uh, also Prime Minister Orban is, is one of the initiators that conservative powers all across Europe should make, should try to, to find the form of cooperation in the European Parliament elections or outside of that in order to be the counter power to the liberal left-wing dominance in the European institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your really great contributions and ideas and making time to, to visit us today and to take part in the conference. Um, Autoyours Institute is currently working on an analysis of the recommendation emerging from the conference on the future of Europe. And uh, we will keep you updated on what kind of Europe uh, the EU is proposing us. Thank you very much again. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you.